What's up all my YouTube buddies? It's me, Jacob, with another video. This is actually the introduction part of my video. Uh, the other parts of this video have already been shot, and I'll share them with you in a second. I just want to introduce the fact that this is the second part of a series of MCU videos that me and my sister are doing. Uh, this video involves uh, the third and fourth MCU films, part of Phase 1. Iron Man 2, directed by Jon Favreau, and Thor, directed by Kenneth Branagh. Uh, we definitely had fun uh, making these videos and talking about our favorite moments, or I think some issues we had with them, and uh, we just had we just had you know good quality uh, sibling time together. We're both fans of the MCU, and we want to share that with you. So without further ado. Enjoy our little talk on Iron Man 2 and Thor. Alright, so Iron Man 2 is the next film in our series of MCU films to catch up all the way up to Avengers Endgame. And Iron Man 2, like it's directed by John Favreau, who also directed the first Iron Man film. It was released two years after the first, and I think even Favreau admitted it seemed like they kind of rushed the sequel in the production when it seems like a lot of the other sequels of the MCU films, there's about a three to four year gap. I think the only other sequel that had a two year gap was Thor and Thor The Dark World and The Dark World's considered one of the weaker films too. Um, Iron Man 2 is interesting because when the movie came out, a lot of people seemed to like this one okay. I think it had a 70 some percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes and I think the consensus was it's no means as good as the first film. But it's still fun regardless. But man, just over time, I feel like the reception for Iron Man 2 has gone down over the years. In fact, a lot of reception I've seen now to this film, especially from audience members, is really negative. Some have even have the opinion that it's the worst MCU film. And so let's talk about Iron Man 2. Oh yeah, let's. Uh, so Iron Man 2 uh, takes place six months after the events of the first Iron Man film. Slight spoilers if you've seen the first film, obviously, this is a series of videos meant for fans. So, obviously, at the end of the first movie, Tony Stark reveals his identity as Iron Man, which is kind of a first in a way, especially in the superhero genre, because a lot of, a lot of superheroes love to keep their identity secret, you know, for uh, safety reasons. But Tony Stark, who's... <laughs> at this celebrity rock star type status decides to break the mold. Uh, going back to that first film, I didn't, I failed to bring this up in the Iron Man review. The, the original ending for Iron Man would have been completely different where Tony Stark was supposed to have kept his identity secret, but Robert Downey Jr. Uh, on the set, completely improv that coming out line where he revealed himself as Iron Man because he thought that was more in line with the character. And it turned out that was one of the best moments of the entire MCU because without that moment, uh, that moment to solidify the MCU's place, I don't think the MCU would be where it is now. So, yeah, so like I was saying, so six months after... Tony Stark's reveal to the world as Iron Man. Uh, things get a little more complicated. Uh, the government wants Tony Stark just to sell his suits to the military. And Tony Stark doesn't like that at all. He, mm -mm. he doesn't trust the government enough and he wants to do his own thing. Other problems start to come awry too. We find out that the arc reactor in its chest that's keeping him alive is actually slowly starting to kill him. And so 
he, he starts to get disillusioned with his uh, status in the role. And then on top of that, you have a new villain in the mix, uh, a character by the name of Whiplash, uh, whose father had ties to the Stark name, but uh, wants revenge because he blames Stark for ruining his family. And so you have that come into play as well. You also have a little bit of Easter eggs, again, and MCU connections building up to the Avengers, uh, kind of like some of the other films. So probably a little more uh, Easter eggs and connections in Iron Man 2 than before, but Iron Man 2 still feels like a standalone movie to me. So, right off the bat, I actually do not think Iron Man 2 is the worst MCU film. I think both of us agree it is not the worst MCU film. In fact, yeah. if you saw our Incredible Hulk video, we pretty much unanimously believe it was the worst, and it definitely felt the most tonally off. And I think the last time I saw Incredible Hulk, I was half asleep. Yeah, it definitely felt tonally off compared to the rest of the MCU, and I find that film mostly very uneventful. Iron Man 2, on the other hand, I think there's a lot in it uh, that's worth talking about. Uh, obviously, the first thing I should bring up, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is, again, excellent. I think that shouldn't be taken away from him, even if you hated the film. I think you can at least admit Robert Downey Jr. was still awesome. I mean, Tony Stark's entrance to this film alone is still really awesome, where it's the opening night of his World's Fair type uh, celebration. Oh, it's called the yeah. Expo. It's kind of modeled like the classic World's Fair type stuff. And so he skydives off an airplane in his Iron Man suit, uh, arrives down on the stage, ACDC, shoot the thrills, play in the background. He's, you know, getting out of the suit into his Tony Stark business attire. You got these dancing girls in the background. It's complete. It's complete Tony Stark. Yeah, dramatic entrance cliche. All rolled into one. It's it's a cool sequence. I had a ball with that. Uh, I think a lot of the story elements I think are really really good. Uh, I think a lot of sequels have the mentality uh, that bigger is always better, and you see a lot of especially a lot of bad sequels. They try to up the action. And a lot of times it loses the heart of what made the original so good. But one, one thing I liked about Iron Man 2, it's definitely felt like a character-driven sequel. I feel like the best MCU sequels are still character-driven at heart. I mean, uh, Guardians 2, I consider a character-driven film. And we'll get to that film in a little while. But yeah. Uh, it's still coming. It's got to take care of baby steps first. Yeah, yeah. Guardians, we're still in phase one. Uh, so like I said, character driven. So most of the film is about Tony Stark fighting, uh, I guess his inner demons. That's kind of an underlying theme of the Tony Stark character, and it's explored even more in Iron Man 3. But Iron Man 2, he's having to deal with the fact that the technology that brought him out of the cave is now killing him again and that leads us uh, of course some inner conflict and of course uh he has a little bit of a drinking problem in this movie too i think it might be i think some i think some might have been disappointed because one of the most famous comic book story arcs in iron man i haven't read it but i've heard about it it's called demon in a bottle and that and that's a story that is all about Tony Stark's drinking problem and how it nearly destroys him. And they don't really go too far with that drinking problem. It's just there just because he's depressed over the suit killing him. But the stuff we still got, uh, like Robert Downey Jr. completely uh, sells what he's doing. He's still, he's still very sarcastic and narcissistic in all the right ways. And yeah, I guess... Uh, some of his actions are very unlikable, but you still see why he's doing them and hurting the people he loves because he's just so torn with what's going on in his life. Uh, I think the political subtext is also something I found uh, very interesting. Uh, how 
Uh, Tony Stark refuses to comply with the government's actions. Of course, one of the senators is played by Gary Shandling, who's just really amazing and just, just hamming up his role. Oh, <laughs> I <goodness>. love it. <laughs> and uh, uh, I find I found it ironic because in this film, Tony Stark doesn't want to hand his suits over, and of course, without going. And I guess spoilers into later on in the MCU. Some events that happen in his life later on in the MCU, he has an opposing view. And I, I, I found that change in his character very interesting. It's definitely interesting seeing that character grow and change in his certain perspectives. But it never came off as jarring. It's just a lengthy event in one man's life. And that's what I love about the MCU. They do a great job at developing these iconic characters. And Iron Man 2 is still a stepping stone. Uh, is there anything else you'd like oh, to add? Oh, yes, up? also uh, Don Cheadle's appearance. Okay, we need to bring up Don Cheadle. Uh, he had a much better Rose. Yeah, he replaced Terrence Howard from the first film because uh, Terrence Howard didn't want to do a multi-film franchise. Don Cheadle definitely was more interested in doing the multi-film franchise. He definitely was more committed to the part. He was more believable playing a military officer than I think Terrence Howard did. And I thought his character was just as engaging as Tony Stark's. Uh, you get to see him in his War Machine outfit for the first time. I find it funny you watch the first Iron Man movie and you see Terrence Howard look at the suit like that the character will wear. Time, baby. He goes, next time, baby. I'm like, uh-uh, it won't be a next time for you. You're not even going to be in it. <laughs> but yeah, he definitely is better. It's nice we can see him in the suit. I like the camaraderie between the two characters. and They, uh, the they, 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 they kind of act like brothers. And it's kind of fun seeing them interact. Uh, there's even this fun little action sequences where they have oh, a brawl, yeah. and it's set to Queen Thelma Bites, bites the Dust. Yeah, cause, yeah, uh, Rhodey didn't like how Tony Stark was acting. He, he got drunk at a, his birthday party uh, when I think the world needed him the most because of some of the actions going on around him, and he thought that was not the right influence uh, for him to do something like that, so they have a little brawl, and they got... Uh, Queen playing in the background. I'm like, oh, this is fun. Alright, another thing that uh, we should bring up. Uh, this is the movie that introduced Scarlett Johansson as Natasha Romanoff. AKA Black Widow. Or Black Widow. Widow. Uh, she starts out in the film. Uh, at, she's, of course, we, uh, we find out later she's the, a spy working for S.H.I.E.L.D. But she starts out as... Tony Stark's new secretary as they appoint Pepper to CEO because Tony wanted her in charge as he's dying. And so she's the new secretary, but of course later we find out she's just a spy trying to see what Tony Stark's up to. I mean, early on, uh, I've always loved that character. Scarlett Johansson is very sly and she definitely had the right physique. Uh, for such a mysterious character and uh, I think a lot of people forget uh, she debuted that character in this film and I, I thought she was really really good uh, I think one of the standout sequences in the film is uh, an action scene near the end where she's taking out all of uh, yeah, uh, these guards poor happy. And, he still was only one yeah, yeah John Favreau has his small appearance as the driver happy and he's trying to learn how to be this good kickboxer. <laughs> Black Widow's knocking out all these guards and Happy's just stuck with that one. <laughs> that, that was fun to watch. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, Black Widow, I think the more I watch her, the more she's become one of my favorite characters within the MCU. And Iron Man 2 was definitely a good start for that character. I'm still shocked that we hadn't got a movie out of her yet because there's definitely the potential when more of the character is developed in the future films but I'm, I'm glad there's become a resurgence in wanting to make uh, female superheroes because it was considered a curse for a while 
uh, with movies like you know, Catwoman, was a big curse, and Supergirl. Yeah, don't get me started on Catwoman. Yeah, you saw Catwoman yeah, full. I, I did not like it. I only caught the last ten minutes, and you it's... You know the Catwoman? Stupid Michelle Pfeiffer. It's trash. That movie's trash. Like, I, not because of how bad her outfit was, but just the filmmaking and everything about yeah, it. Yeah, that was time. But that outfit was pretty bad. <laughs> okay. But I'm glad to see uh, female superheroes make a bit of a resurgence. You had Wonder Woman. And Captain Marvel looks really good. I can't wait to see that. Yeah, same here. Uh, we got DC's got that Birds of Prey movie coming out, which is this all-female girl group led by Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn. And I think Black Widow's supposed to get her own movie now that the resurgence is there. I yeah, mean, even she's still got it coming. I mean, even the Wasp uh, got co-title credit in Ant Man and the Wasp, which is something. At least that's something. Yeah, at least that's something going. Yeah, on. maybe the Wasp can get a solo movie down the line because she was kind of the scene stealer of that film. We'll see what happens after the end game. Okay. So, enough MCU rambling, back to Iron Man 2. Another thing I really liked in Iron Man 2, even though it's a character-driven story, I, I feel like Favreau was more confident in handling the individual action set pieces. I, I think we could all agree the first movie, the weakest part of the film, was the more over-the-top climax. Even though I still thought it was fun, but it definitely lost a little bit of steam somewhat. All the action in Iron Man 2 is really exciting. It's definitely better directed. And it definitely shows, uh, proves Favreau as an A-class director. And there's only like three action set pieces in the uh, film. You have yeah, the, the, racetrack, the in racetrack in Monaco where Mickey Rourke emerges as Whiplash. And you have, that's a really cool scene. It's definitely intense. It's also surprisingly really funny, especially when you got Pepper involved in the scene. And he's giving her head off and happy trying to run with flesh over with the car. <laughs> that scene is just great. I love that. It's <laughs> it's funny. And then you have the brawl between Tony Stark and Rhodes. And then you have the climax of the film, which involves all these militarized yeah, drones, drones, Air Force drones, and you have and then then the they narrow it down to this garden type dome place and my easily my favorite action set piece in the film is where Iron Man and War Machine team up and they take down all those drones and it's very comic booky and it's but it's still done in a way where you can still buy into it and take it seriously even though yeah, it's obviously so over the top. Saying, Two heads are better than one. It's a cool scene. All right, it's not like we really like this film, but uh, let's move on to the negatives. Uh, I think the worst thing about the film, easily, it's villains. Uh, oh yeah. It's I led by it's led by Mickey Rourke, who plays Whiplash. And to be fair, Mickey Rourke is a great actor. If you have not seen The Wrestler, he is phenomenal in that movie, and it is definitely worth checking out if you're a fan. Um, gritty dramas. Uh, I, the character had potential as this character. Yeah, he just failed to bring it. Torn, yeah, torn by uh, what this character is supposed to be celebrated, and he blames the Stark name for ruining his family. That had potential, but the movie really failed to dive in uh, to dive into his character. And I don't even think Rourke, I don't even think Rourke was the right actor for that character. Uh, he's given a Russian accent, and it is so fake yeah, and cheesy. Yeah, half the time you don't even know what he's saying or talking about. Yeah, I think that's, I think that shows how bad it is. Uh, it's so fake and cheesy. And it's very all over the place. Uh, Did they, they put subtitles down or something? Um, I it could have like, yeah, I can understand what he was saying, but I still thought the accent was so fake and cheesy. It's about as fake and cheesy as Kate Blanchett's Russian accent in uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. 
But Kate Blanchett was more hilarious, though. I'll give her that. But Mickey Rourke's well, trying to. Stuff, but know. Mickey Rourke's trying to play it seriously. Uh, there's one scene that gets a laugh out of me almost every time I watch it. Uh, he see he watches his dad die at the beginning of the film, and he yeah. does this. He's, he does this emotional cry, but his delivery, it's he's like. Ugh! <laughs> it takes you out of the movie. It's 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 just so bad. <laughs> then we move on. Um, scenes to watch. It's they they do very little with the character. I mean, half the time he's just sitting there and he goes, "I want my bird." You know, that's why his mind. I want my bird. No, that is not my bird. I want my bird. I really do not like that bird. I want my bird. <laughs> And it's like, what? Why are we doing this? Is this, is this supposed to be the running gag of the film? Because it's not that funny. Yeah, there's, like, better, there's better running gags. It's it, it's it's weird, and you're wasting so much time on this really lame joke when you, you could have spent that time better developing the character. Uh, another antagonist in the film is this rival competitor of Tony Stark, uh, played by Sam Rockwell. And who kind of who kind of teams up with Mickey Rourke to make the weapons up? Say Tony Stark. Yeah, Hammer could have been the better. Villain. I like I, I I really liked Sam Rockwell in the film. He's definitely an over the top character. Uh, I think he kind of is more of the true villain of the film, I guess, than Whiplash, but. Whiplash definitely had more potential to be the great villain, and it's just kind of sad that they spend more time on that character who's kind of more over the top and hammy even someone who's trying to play it you know really serious uh serious revenge on the stark name and it's uh, it's really weird one thing I think if i if you had me in charge uh writing these Iron Man films. Obviously, I'm not a real screenwriter, but I think if I had done this story, if I had, if I was blessed with that talent, I think what I probably would have done, I think like I had said in my review of the first Iron Man, I think I would have made Jeff Bridges' character the main antagonist of Iron Man 2. They would have kind of introduced him in the first film. I uh, kind of slowly set him up to be bitter and jealous of the Stark name. Uh, slowly becoming bad. I mean, I mean, maybe they can show that he was the one who betrayed Stark and tried to get him killed, which is how Iron Man was born. Mm -hmm. uh, but not not make him a real threat until the sequel. But maybe in the sequel he builds that Iron Monger suit. Maybe what they maybe could have done in two. Maybe he collaborates with Justin Hammer, Sam Rockwell. To try to upstage Tony Stark, and it'd be uh, two against one, to say the least. I think that would have worked. I think, uh, I think it's kind of a guarantee in superhero movies. If you if you kind of tease your villain, throw all the stepping stones of the character, and have him grow as a villain in the sequel, uh, that tends to work. I hope that really happens with. Uh, Black Manta and Aquaman, they kind of did that, and I'm hoping he gets more to do in the inevitable Aquaman sequel, because Aquaman made over a billion dollars. Yeah. But, uh, I kind of wish they had did that with uh, Jeff Bridges, because I think Obadiah Stane, I thought he was a flawed character, development-wise, but he was definitely far more interesting than, hey, what my bud? <laughs> yeah, what Black Definitely one of my least favorite Marvel villains. So yeah, Iron Man 2. Uh, did you find this better or worse than the first? Did you like it? I think... Uh, which one is, Which one do you think is better? Uh, I think I can watch the first one again. I'm pretty sure that one's a much better one. Yeah, uh, I think the f 2... Uh, I, don't, I don't think 2 is near as good as 1. I love the first one. It's still in my top 10 MCU films. Iron Man 2 is near the bottom of my list, but it's like the third worst. But that doesn't mean I think the film is bad. Uh, the only film I don't have a positive grade for is Incredible Hulk, uh, by the way. 
I do think Iron Man 2 is a good film. The stuff that really works, I think, is worth your time, especially the character stuff, especially uh, how Tony Stark is developed as a character. I think the action is, be is better directed and handled. I liked the introduction of Black Widow into the film. There's a lot of good MCU connections and Easter eggs. It's really cool. Uh, I, I did like the choice of ACDC music throughout the film. And yeah, I, I don't really think the film is that bad aside from uh, some pacing missteps and how the villains are handled. Other than that, I thought the film was pretty good. I don't really see why it's considered a terrible film for some people. I guess it wasn't the movie some people were expecting, I guess. I guess a lot of people wanted the sequel to have more action and stakes. I think they get that. I think that eventually happens in 3, but 3 is also very divisive among audiences depending on how yeah, you are with, the last Jedi as the Depending on how you are with Shane Black as a filmmaker, but we'll get to Iron Man 3 when we get there. Iron Man 2, I think, is fine. It's a fine film. I think the stuff that works uh, really does work, but it's definitely still a weaker MCU film as a whole. Uh, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap this up? I'm, I'm good. Okay, so... Just settling forward to the next movie, which has one of my favorite Hollywood cuties in it. But yeah, four is definitely next. So uh, how would you rate Iron Man two? I give you... it uh, four out of five stars. Yeah, so you did enjoy this film a lot more than Incredible Hulk. Yeah, Hulk was just boring for me. Yeah, uh, Iron Man two, like I said, it has its moments, and I'm gonna give it a four out of five as well on the hundred point scale. Uh, I'm gonna give it a seventy four out of a hundred. The only reason it's on the lower end of the scale, like I said. The pacing can be a little jarring, especially when it cuts to the villains. It's, it it kind of drags, but the rest of the film, I think, is a solid watch. Alright, next up is Thor, and we'll see you then. Next up on our MCU binge is Thor, directed by Kenneth Branagh. An interesting choice for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, at the time, he was mainly known for directing uh, Shakespeare adaptations. So him helming a big blockbuster like Thor was a very unpredictable he's move. Yeah, and obviously after Thor, he's directed nothing but blockbusters ever since. He directed like the newest Jack Ryan film. He directed... Disney Cinderella remake and Murder on the Orient Express and now he's got Artemis Fowl coming out yeah. this summer. So it's interesting the director he's become since he started at since he started you know being the Shakespeare nut he is. Uh so definitely interesting choice. Uh Thor, obviously based on the Marvel comic and also based on Norse mythology. Uh, obviously, Thor, of course, is the god of thunder in Norse mythology. He's played by Chris Hemsworth. And pretty much the movie is a story of how he enters the mold of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He's this really cocky, arrogant warrior who... His arrogance causes a war between feuding uh, realms... And so he gets stripped of his powers, and he's banished to Earth. And you pretty much get a redemption story throughout. And you have other Shakespearean-inspired stuff as well. Betrayal, jealousy, obsession, all that fun stuff. Thor is, uh, to me, Thor is presented in an interesting way because the way Kenneth Branagh helms this film, the stuff on Asgard is very majestic, grandiose, and has a lot of neat visuals and set pieces. Has a lot of weight to it. 
You have, you know, jealous brothers competing over the throne, and you have, uh, you know, different things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then Thor is down to Earth, and it turns into a fish out of water type comedy when he's on Earth. Yeah, different world doesn't know what all's happening or going on. Yeah. Doesn't know how to, where to look. It's kind of a strange little tonal shift, but I feel like uh, he managed to balance both tones really well, especially since the film definitely it always cuts between the two different sequences. You know, have Thor on Earth for a while, then you have the drama in Asgard for another bit. It's handled quite nicely, and I enjoyed both plots. I, I know what you're here mainly to talk about. Well, yeah, before I get into the woo-woo stuff, yeah, I did like the production design on Asgard. Yeah, that, like I was saying, Asgard, definitely some great stuff. Uh, the, the sets and the visuals and just the way it looked. And obviously that's a design, the design that's carried through throughout the remainder of the Thor movies, even with different directors. I think a lot of people liked the look and design of Asgard. Uh, Chris Hemsworth, I thought was a great choice to play Thor. I thought he definitely did a great job at, you know, being uh, cocky. I mean, and I like the progression of him being from a cocky warrior to a humble guy. And I thought that worked very well in this film. Hemsworth, I think, also pulled off the weight of the character. And also, he's just, he's just so naturally funny, too. Mm -hmm. I think some people complained about how, like, some people thought Ragnarok kind of messed up the weight of Thor with it being so jokey. But, you know, I thought Thor was an over-the-top character even from the beginning. And just Ragnarok kind of exploited that untapped potential. And we yeah. got to see beginnings of that in this movie, especially when Thor is stripped down to Earth. Yeah, we're getting the run of the rock. It's coming. Yeah. Uh, I always like that part where Thor's in the restaurant and he loves that drink. He's like, this drink's delicious. Oh, la, la. oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Not a big coffee drinker for me. Yeah. Well, at least Thor but likes it. But that's still it. a funny scene, though. Yeah, at least Thor likes his coffee. He especially doesn't like tea. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I find that much of strange. He doesn't like tea. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, f for a while, the MCU has been criticized for its lackluster films. Well, we don't have one in four because we got Loki, played by Tom Hiddleston. Yeah, the guy in Mischief. Loki is just awesome. You never know what he's going to do. He's very unpredictable, and Hiddleston just nails everything great about that character. Uh, you know, he's, you, know, you kind of feel for him when you find out his backstory, and you, I think for some people you kind of sympathize with him, but he's also very slimy and hard to trust. You just enjoy what the guy does. He's just fun to be around with. Hey, he's a trickster for a reason. I think his main plot is kind of all over the place because you know he'll claim to do one thing and then he'll do the exact opposite in the next scene you're like where is this going but uh other than that just his personality alone is worth watching yeah, dude even make though, up your mind even though i think his scheming and i think the overall villain plot is kind of muddled and convoluted I think another thing worth mentioning about Thor is it was the first Marvel film in the MCU to expand the universe into the cosmos. Uh, obviously, we get to see, they talk about the nine realms in the universe and how everything is connected. Um, obviously, we see some of those realms, including Asgard and also Jotunheim, yeah, the, the world of the Frost Giants. And obviously Earth. So we get to see more of the universe beyond Earth. And they pulled that off quite nicely, I think. And thankfully Thor was such a big hit that 
I think without four kind of paving the way, we wouldn't have movies like Guardians of the Galaxy or Infinity War. So that's definitely something to consider when talking about Thor. All right, so uh, action standpoint, it's definitely not an action-driven film, even though there is some fun action set pieces in the film. I think my favorite is when they're in Jotunheim and Thor's taking down all those frost giants, the the war he ends up starting because of his arrogance. I thought that was a fun little sequence. Mm -hmm. I kind of toys around with the head frost giant, and he's about to back off, and then he goes, You better run back home, little princess. <laughs> and then this crazy little uh, petty fight happens, and it's just fun to watch, and you kind of see the beginnings of this very macho character that just enjoys what he does with his magic hammer. <laughs> I find it a shame in all the Thor movies and you know how over the top Thor gets. It is a shame that whether it was in Thor or the Avengers, Thor never stopped before beating up somebody with his hammer and said, Hammer time! Like he's MC Hammer. <laughs> Maybe I... Apparently MC Hammer didn't want to use his copyright. I don't know. It's expensive, maybe. <laughs> yeah. He's got to make money, too, off that song alone. It's like, only hit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you have anything else? No, uh, yeah, well, um... Yeah, comment what I do about celebrities with abs. I think hunks are cute. You, you like Chris Hemsworth's abs. You just watch a whole movie of Chris Hemsworth's abs. He'll be shirtless in the entire movie. And you'll be like, ah, 10 out of 10. Bravo. Okay, that's just fan service. I mean, yeah, well, um, I would enjoy Hemsworth with or without a shirt on, okay? Okay. Anything else? Oh, uh, yeah, well, um... Uh... And movie couples, there's uh, Natalie Portman and uh, Chris Hemsworth. You got, well, we got to talk about the... Oh, we're talking about the relationship between Natalie Portman and Chris Hemsworth. Well, at least she's been with better guys. Uh, the thing with Natalie Portman, I, I know she's openly talked about how she didn't like being a part of the MCU. Their chemistry's fine. Yeah, but it didn't last long. Uh, it's fine. Uh... I, I, it's kind of hard to buy into the fact that they're madly in love with each other and they only were on Earth for like two days. But I think their chemistry is fine. It's definitely more interactive than uh, Edward Norton and Liv Tyler and The Incredible Hulk. They, yeah, they, that they, uh, didn't go anywhere. They had nothing. But uh, it's fine. I just think the romance is a little underdeveloped. It might have worked better if maybe there was a longer time of Thor on Earth, but as is the romance is Yeah, fine. but Thor went that back home to fix problems. Yeah, I, I get that, but uh I think the romance could have been a little stronger. That was one of the things I think the dark world I think did a little better. I think I got into the romance a little better and the Dark World, even though The Dark World is a more lackluster film overall. But we'll get to Dark World when we get there. We're still in phase one, of course. Do uh, you have anything else? Uh, looks like you mostly have... You mostly have some of your favorite individual moments in the film. Yeah, is there an individual uh, moment you want to bring up? Do you think it's worth talking about? Yeah, well, some of my negatives are, oh. um, yeah, for Owen, he never, uh, explains anything to anybody. See, his problem there, his solution was to not talk about it. You know, like, the I monkey think, being adopted. Yeah, you think they would have told him that sooner, right? Uh, it, it, that doesn't make sense to me either, but you just kind of buy into it, because that's just the nature of the Odin character, him being so mysterious, and the fact that, you know, he talks about how great he is as a ruler, but, uh, they explain a little bit more of this in 
Ragnarok, but he's not always the perfect figure that they make him out to be in history. Then they touch upon that in Ragnarok, like I said, but well, I guess we might, we'll probably talk about more of that in Ragnarok, but it is interesting. I do like Anthony Hopkins as Odin. He, uh, he definitely was the right actor to play that character. Speaking of, Thor did have a great cast. Obviously, we already brought up Chris Hemsworth. Tom Hiddleston. I also liked Anthony Hopkins. And then uh, Idris Elba as Heimdall, the gatekeeper. And I got his character just kind of grew in the sequels. And uh, his career kind of took off uh, thanks to the MCU. Because I think he was always a supporting actor in movies prior to this. But he just exploded as like an A-list actor. Thanks to his, you know, small supporting role as Heimdall, people were like, oh yeah, that's Idris Elba. He's he's kind of cool. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, and of course you have Renee Russo as Thor's mom. Uh, and then you have the the Lady Sif in the Warriors Three. They don't really do much with those characters. That they're used okay. In the first movie, but I got bummed that they kind of got sidelined in the later films to get to other things. And those were characters I wanted to see flesh out more because they had so much potential, I thought. Standalone movies, uh, maybe. Could see that happen. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen now after what Taika Waititi did in Ragnarok, but <laughs> okay. Origin stories, who knows? All right. So, you brought up a little negative. Oh, yeah. Well, I meet uh, Hawk at, but he doesn't uh, do That's, much. Yeah. Uh, so, this is, the, yeah, like we said, this is the first movie where they introduced Jeremy Renner as Hawk guy, who be, later became a major player in the Avengers films. I'm okay with them teasing characters down the road, but they do nothing with this character. Uh, he just draws an arrow and says, I'm kind of room for this guy. Yeah, uh, he's. they have him on standby. There's when uh, Thor breaks into the shield base, they have Thor's hammer in there because you know, the hammer came down in the crater. And so Thor's trying to get it back. And so they got, like I said, Hawkeye on standby with his arrow in sight. But yeah, that's all they do. <laughs> you think... Uh, you know, Hawkeye says I'm rooting for this guy. Maybe he could have teamed up with Thor in the climax of the film when they're on Earth and that Destroyer guy shows up. I know that wouldn't have been a fair fight, but uh, Hawkeye is this determined uh, individual. He could have at least tried. I don't know. I don't think it's more screen time than the Avengers. Yeah, but even then, Hawkeye was a character. If for, me, for me, Hawkeye, for me, didn't become a true fleshed out character to me until Age of Ultron. Uh, which was kind of impressive because like Hawkeye was like my least favorite character in the Avengers. But uh, I like how they they get characters their uh, their just due uh, when you know the time's right. Except with the Warriors 3. We never got that. Hopefully they'll give Sif another chance. But uh, not the Warriors 3. Uh, I think this is a little thing I had issue with. With the film. They do that a lot. For like half the movie. There's shots where they do Dutch angles. And... Yeah, sometimes it's uh, pretty strange. I see why they did stuff like that. It's a stylistic director's choice. But a lot of these Dutch angle shots were done in the weirdest places. Like, there's like the shield, the shield group is leaving uh, town in one scene, and they do like shots like that. And I'm like, why are they doing it in those shots? I would do Dutch angle shots on like some close ups and maybe some aerial shots but they, they do them in the weirdest places and it got a little overdone for me i guess it was kind of showing how bombastic the film was but i think they kind of overdid it a little bit but that's just me uh do you have any favorite moments in thor 
yeah, well, there's a, yeah, Thor drinking coffee and him walking to a pet store saying, I need a horse. Oh, you like that, I need a horse. Uh, no, we don't have any horses. We just have dogs, cats, birds. <laughs> yeah, we'll get one big enough to ride on. <laughs> We probably should have flipped that because I think I do the better Thor impersonation. But okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not an Aussie, okay? Well, I'm not either, but I I think my voice is a little deeper, so I can definitely do the full voice a little better. <laughs> Keep doing you. Keep doing you. <laughs> since we like, since we like all these different voices, maybe we should challenge ourselves with a. Impersonation challenge video, <laughs> like what Brian Hole does. Yeah, but, that guy. Oh, Brian Hole's cool. All right. Uh, so, uh, is that so? You brought up those comical scenes. You, uh, do you have a favorite action moment in Thor? I talked about the Frost Giant. Oh, scene yeah, see the where uh, Thor gets his powers back. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, with the destroyer and everything. That was an amazing character moment, uh, I think, where you know, where Thor's willing to uh, give up his life to save his uh, f his newfound friends and his old friends. And it was that uh, humility uh, was what got him his powers back. Uh, that was a neat little way of doing it. It didn't feel like a cop-out or in any way. And just that scene where he just... The hammer comes back, and then his armor comes back on him. It's a cool little visual moment. Uh, definitely. Alright, so I think we're about to wrap up on Thor. Uh, I think Thor is a really good origin story for the character. Uh, obviously, Chris Simsworth is already committed to the role from day one. And I like how the franchise kind of grew over time. I, I think it was a little splotchy. A little bit at first, but then Thor just got better and better. Uh, once uh, I think once they figured out what to do with him after uh, Dark World, but I think for his first outing, it was a, a pretty good run. I, I like the mix between you know the heavy hitting Shakespearean style drama with Norse mythology. And the fish out of water comedy. Didn't you say um, when the movie ended after we saw it just now that uh, some of the comedy reminded you a little bit of Sword in the Stone? Well, some of that the scene at the crater. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Sword in the Stone they, kind of. Where they're trying to, yeah, because you have to be worthy to possess you know, the power of Mir Mir, whatever it's pronounced. <laughs> that. Weird pronounce uh, uh, that weird yeah, pronounced hammer. Yeah, we'll look at these North pronunciations. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, uh, but I I still really enjoyed the film. Uh, I think kind of an underrated film. I think compared to some of the other MCU films, I still think it's probably in the bottom half when ranking all the MCU films as a whole. But I think. I think Thor kind of deserves more love because of how solid they introduced the character. And the fact that it was the first MCU film, like I said, that expanded into the cosmos. Without Thor's success, we wouldn't have had Guardians of the Galaxy, people. Come on, give this film some love. Alright, so what's your overall rating of Thor? Four out of five. Four out of five. Uh... Four and a half for me. I, I had a blast with this. Uh, like I said, especially with Hemsworth and the way the they balance the tones and Branagh's overall direction aside from the weird Dutch angles. But I, I still think the film's really good. 100 point scale, I'm going to give it an 86 out of 100. A uh, really great film. Uh, so once again, Jamie, thank you for being a part of this second part in our, the MCU series. Oh, you're welcome. I know you're a fan of these movies, and I hope you'll stick around uh, all the way up to Endgame. Yeah. That's yeah, all. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Okay, so that was our uh, thoughts and reviews of Iron Man 2 and Thor. 
I hope you stuck around for this lengthy video and had a blast uh, watching us talk about these movies. Uh, so let us know down below what you thought of both these movies. Uh, do you like them? Do you hate them? Do you think they're in the weaker part of the MCU? Or do you think they're hidden gems? Uh, whatever your thoughts are, please be respectful and consider the voters' opinions. We're not all going to have the same opinions, but that's what makes us unique. And that aspect should be shared. In respectful ways, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Click the subscribe button to see more content. And click the little bell next to it to be notified of future videos. Got some more videos coming for you soon. Uh, definitely keep your ears open for our next MCU video, which will involve Captain America the First Avenger and the Avengers. I know you love uh, Captain yeah. America. Yeah, another celebrity I find cute. Oh, Chris Evans. Do you like him better uh, without the beard or with a beard? Both. Okay. <laughs> All right, hope you have an amazing day. See you next time. Goodbye. Bye.